Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to give this year's Marty Feldstein's lecture. And I'm grateful to Jim Poterba for, uh, of course, his uh, incredible words, too kind. And to the National Bureau of Economic Research for this invitation. I also want to thank Kathy Feldstein, who's been so kind to be with us today. The MBR is a cornerstone of economic thinking worldwide. You've guided the work of policymakers and contributed to making the world a better place. I'm personally very grateful for the research you have produced during my time in government and central banks. I would also like to pay tribute to the late Marty Feldstein. He was a towering figure throughout my career. In fact, it was thanks to an invitation from him that I attended the first Summer Institute back in, I think, 78, you said 79, 78, we discussed that, but it's 78. And even uh, my words today will refer to the several conversation I had with him on the topic of today. His work on tax policy, public expenditure and savings behavior has transformed the way we think about entire areas of research. Marty's research always combined insightful ideas with robust empirical evidence and policy relevance. And as the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors of President Ronald Reagan, he spearheaded a paradigm shift in the relationship between governments and markets, not just in the United States, but worldwide. And he did all of this while continuing to care deeply for undergraduate and graduate students, monitoring many generations of economists. My lecture today will focus on a topic that was very close to Marty's heart the creation of the European Monetary Union and its future, of which Martin was extremely skeptical. <laughs> the fundamental macroeconomic challenge of forming a monetary union was laid out by Robert Mandel in his 1961 piece and centered on the management of asymmetric shocks. As monetary policy and exchange rate policy would then be allocated to the management of common shocks, other adjustment mechanisms would be needed to address asymmetric shocks and prevent them from triggering prolonged regional slumps. Mandel identified those mechanisms, those adjustment mechanisms, as fiscal transfers and labor and capital mobility which could stabilize demand exposed in depressed regions. In the later literature, the crucial role of risk sharing via capital market integration was also recognized, which would uh, limit the size of local shocks ex ante. The euro, however, went ahead with few of these conditions in place. Fiscal transfers among member states in form of assuming each other's debts were outlawed in the Maastricht Treaty, reflecting a philosophy where countries would, quote, keep their own house in order, unquote, and not rely on the largesse of others. Regional adjustment through labor mobility was underdeveloped with studies at the time finding that the majority of employment shocks were absorbed through changes in the participation rate rather than migration. And there was no serious attempt to integrate European financial markets beyond soft regulatory alignment. So why did they do it? Perhaps I should say, why did we do it? Viewed from this side of the Atlantic, the reasons were often incomprehensible. Many economists 
warned that the European Monetary Union was doomed to fail, that the elites had cheated their people. And as Marty warned in a famous 1997 article for Foreign Affairs, that the consequences would be stark, condemning the European Union both as an economic and a, as a political project. But there was always another, another perspective, which was that the Euro was the consequence of decades of past integration, notably the evolution of Europe's single market, and it was only one more step along a much longer road towards political union. From this viewpoint, the key question was not whether the euro area was an optimal currency area from the start. Evidently, it was not. But whether European countries were prepared to make it converge towards one over time. The immediate aftermath of the creation of the euro, however, added to the doubts of the skeptics. And it's easy to see why many did not view this political narrative as credible, especially once the euro was launched and the next steps in political union began to unfold. When given the chance to demonstrate their commitment to political union in the form of a European constitution, Europeans rejected it. And the European Union then, later, elected to enlarge to Eastern Europe in the mid-2000s without reforming its decision-making rules, arguably weakening rather than strengthening its political nature. But having taken part in the negotiations for monetary union in the early 1990s, as head of the Italian Treasury, I can attest that this political motivation was real. The goal of building an ever closer European Union ran deep, born out of the ashes of the World War II, passed down through generations of political leaders, and conceived, above all, to avoid conflict in Europe. And the single currency was seen as a fundamental step towards that goal and to preserve the achievements of the single market. The priority was therefore to seize the historical moment, not to wait until every necessary condition was in place. And there was a genuine belief that the core commitment of European unity would create the political will to address any design flaws that were uncovered along the way. So we move forward, sidestepping our contradictions, but in the firm belief that they would be resolved over time. In the meantime, success would depend on three conditions being met. First, national fiscal stabilizers would have to be able to operate freely, which, given the size of national budgets in Europe, could, under normal conditions, and I stress under normal conditions, provide substantial stabilization of local shocks. Estimates at the time suggested that national budgets could provide as much stabilization of asymmetric shocks as the US federal budget. Second, the political commitment to the euro would have to create implicit transfers in place of explicit ones via fiscally weaker countries borrowing the credibility of fiscally stronger ones and enjoying lower financing costs. They would allow governments to implement stabilization policies without threatening their market access. Third, fiscal rules would have to be designed and applied in such a way as to anchor confidence in the medium term soundness of public finances so that counter cyclical expansions would not engender fundamental questions of solvency. <clears throat> 
In that way, the promises that underlay those implicit transfers will never have to be tested. For the first decade of the euro, the first two of these conditions broadly held. Markets viewed euro area sovereign issuers as essentially interchangeable, with spreads on Italian bonds converging to within a few basis points of German ones. And national fiscal stabilizers were able to operate relatively freely when faced with moderate economic shocks, such after 9-11 or the dot-com bust. But the third condition failed. Europe fiscal rules were built around deficit limits with a ceiling of 3% of GDP, which created an, a, a, an inbuilt procyclicality. Whenever a country grew quickly, it would see revenue windfalls, which made the deficit ceiling look slack, leading in turn to rising spending commitments and higher structural deficits. But if the cycle turned sharply, those revenues would evaporate while the structural commitments remained, rapidly reducing fiscal space. As a result, when faced with a very large shock after the Lehman bust, deficits ballooned. And fearing widespread defaults, private creditors were also bailed out by governments pushing public, debt, public debts closer to levels that could not be sustained by implicit transfers alone. The constructive ambiguity of the common commitment to the euro had to be filled by detailed plans of what would happen in extremis. Governments initially responded by expanding the euro area's policy framework to allow limited transfers in the form of IMF-style financial assistance. And they did so successfully, launching the first Greek bailout and a common European financing mechanism. But then EU leaders announced in late 2010 that future bailouts would be subject to sovereign debt restructuring the so-called Deauville Agreement. In an instant, this cut off implicit transfers and injected credit risk into all European sovereign bonds. It left us with two stark choices. The first was to accept widespread sovereign failures in order to reset the union at lower debt levels, thereby preserving the principle that fiscally stronger states should not pay for weaker ones. But precisely because initial debt levels were so high and holdings of sovereign paper were concentrated within the euro area banking system, defaults could not, be, could not remain contained even except for very few limited cases. Fearing principal losses and, at worst, redenomination into lower value currencies, investors sold off the public debt of any country perceived to be vulnerable, triggering a vicious circle of worsening bank balance sheets, right, tightening credit conditions, and tumbling growth and ultimately deep financial fragmentation. By 2012, spreads vis-a-vis -vis German 10-year government bonds reached 500 basis points in Italy, 600 basis points in Spain, with even wider spreads in Greece, Portugal, and Ireland. As all these economies represented a third of Euro area GDP, it was unthinkable that the rest of the Union would not be pulled under without a change of tack. The second option was therefore to make transfers more explicit, which is what Europe ultimately did, if in a suboptimal way. It expanded its common financing mechanisms 
which increased the risk sharing through cross-border lending within the Union. Recent literature finds that before the sovereign debt crisis, only around 40% of country-specific shocks in the euro area were absorbed as measured by the deviation between consumption and output. Since the official as assistance was in place, around 60% of shocks were smoothed out. This landed in turn facilitated the form of fiscal transfers as public creditors extended their loans decades into the future at very low fixed interest rates, which will lead over time to large intertemporal transfers to countries that received financial assistance. This response inched the euro area closer to an optimal currency area, but the transfers still fell some way short of the model that Mandel had imagined. The key problem was that their stabilizing effect was undermined in the countries receiving these transfers by the strict terms of the accompanying adjustment programs. And at the same time, Europe's pro-cyclical fiscal rules compounded the weakness in demand by inducing an aggregate fiscal contraction into a recessionary shock. As countries strive to stay on the right side of the deficit limits, the euro area fiscal stance tightened by around four percentage points of potential GDP between 2011 and 2013. Even in countries that had ample fiscal space and suffered no market pressure, thereby reducing demand for exports from countries without fiscal space. And around two thirds of the overall fiscal consolidation came through tax increases rather than expenditure cuts, thus further lowering disposable income and consumption. The difficult road towards building an optimal monetary union was illustrated by the divergent responses in Europe to these developments. In Greece and other countries, years of austerity fueled rising populism. But in Germany, Euroscepticism also rose as new parties appeared opposing bailouts and keeping weaker countries on board. For all these problems, however, the euro survived. The European Central Bank announced in 2012 that it would be within its mandate to do, as uh, James just reminded us, <laughs> to do whatever it takes to save the euro. A decision sanctioned by the European Court of Justice three years later, because they took us to tribunal. <laughs> Investors stopped betting against the dissolution of the common currency since they knew that Europe's decision makers would never allow it to happen. And governments of all colors and from all countries continued to stand behind the project, preferring to help even the weaker countries to stay, even the weaker states, to remain part of the Union. There is still no agreement today in the euro area around a central budget for stabilization purposes or cross-border fiscal transfers. And this begs the question of whether the currency area can ever be truly stable without further integration in this domain. There is no doubt it would be a desirable end goal to have a central fiscal capacity for stabilization purposes, as regions will always be exposed to asymmetric shocks. But three factors suggest that it may no longer be a sine qua non condition. First, over time, the euro area has gradually converged closer to the other ideal conditions that Mandel laid out, somewhat mitigating the need for fiscal transfers. 
25 years of economic and monetary union have led to more integrated supply chains and more synchronized business cycles as, and the euro can explain at least half of the overall increase. At the same time, while labor mobility in the euro area remains some way short of US levels, studies have shown a gradual convergence reflecting both a fall in interstate migration in the United States and a rise in the role of migration in Europe. And channels of risk sharing have improved further. For example, against the backdrop of banking sector integration, the so-called banking union, and generous official assistance, cross-border lending was notably more resilient during the pandemic than we had seen during the previous large shocks. The further Europe can advance along this path, especially in terms of integrating its capital markets, the lower the need for permanent fiscal transfer will be. Second, the ability of national fiscal policies to stabilize the cycle has been bolstered by changing reaction function of the central bank. Since 2012, the ECB has identified unwarranted increase in sovereign spreads as a fundamental impediment to the smooth transmission of monetary policy and has consistently developed a set of policy tools to, ad to address such threats. The reaction function has placed an effective floor under sovereign bond markets in cases where spreads are not fundamentally driven. A floor that has proven to be effective even when the stance of monetary and fiscal policies had not been aligned. For example, euro era governments were able to undertake a sizable fiscal stimulus to offset the effects of the energy crisis last winter even as policy rates were rising steeply and the economy was stalling and the economy was stalling with the euro area transferring more than 200 billion euros to the rest of the world in, in form of a terms of trade tax. This would have been likely impossible 10 years ago, even when even small rate increases prove destabilizing. It suggests that something has fundamentally changed in how investors view the euro area and the leeway that they are prepared to provide. Third, third reason, the nature of the shocks is changing. With the pandemic, the energy crisis and the war in Ukraine we are increasingly confronting common imported shocks rather than asymmetric domestically created ones. This shifts, this shifts the problem from supporting struggling states towards addressing shared challenges and so creates a different alignment of political preferences. As the episode I described earlier illustrated, cyclical risk sharing is hard to implement in Europe because political preferences are severely disaligned. But for shared goals such as health, defense, and climate transition, policy preferences are overlapping and the need for higher spending commitments is incontrovertible. The European response to pandemic acknowledged this new reality. It forced Europe to centralize important areas of health policy, as the Commission proved a more effective buyer of vaccines than individual states could be. The restrictions which were necessary to slow the spread of the virus also led to the creation of a joint fund to support labor markets across the Euro area or was named Schuller. Ultimately, Europe agreed on the creation of a 700 billion, 750 billion euro fund 
it's called Next Generation EU, to support countries in addressing the green and digital transitions, which demand much greater investment than individual countries alone can afford. And so, if the degree of convergence within the euro area is higher, the frequency of asymmetric shocks is lower. And common funding of shared goal increases, the rarer will become the instances where a fiscal capacity is really needed. The key question now is whether Europe can open up a different road towards fiscal union. History tells us that common budgets have rarely been created as an adjunct to monetary integration, but rather to deliver specific goals in the public interest. In the US, it was the War of Independence that delivered the famous Hamiltonian moment of debt assumption by the federal government. In Canada and Germany, the first direct federal taxes, aside from customs duties, were created to generate new revenues to fund the First World War. It was the need to overcome the Great Depression that led the expansion of the US federal budget in the 30s. Similarly, Europe has until today never faced so many shared supranational goals, by which I mean goals that cannot be managed by countries acti acting alone. We are undergoing a series of major transitions which will require vast common investments. The European Commission puts the investment needs for the green transition and more than 600 billion euro annually until 2030. And between a quarter and a fifth of this will have to be funded by the public sector. We are also facing a geopolitical transition driven by US-China decoupling in which we can no longer rely on unfriendly countries for critical supplies. That will require a substantial reorientation of investments towards building capacity at home or with new partners. And never in the history of the European Union have its founding values of peace, democracy, and freedom be challenged as much as they are by the war in Ukraine. One immediate consequence is that we must make a transition towards much stronger common European defense if we are, at minimum, to meet the NATO military expenditure target of 2% of GDP. But as it stands, Europe's institutional construct is not well suited to carry out those transitions as comparisons with the US reveals. Here, we are seeing a new focus on the so-called statecraft, where federal spending, regulatory changes, and tax incentives align to pursue US strategic goals. The Inflation Reduction Act, for example, will simultaneously accelerate green spending, attract foreign investment, and restructure supply chains in America's favor. But Europe lacks an equivalent strategy to integrate EU-level spending, state aid rules, and national fiscal plans, as the example of climate change shows. Once the next generation EU expires, there is no proposal for a federal instrument to replace it to carry out the necessary climate-related spending. EU state aid rules limit the ability of national authorities to actively pursue green industrial policy. And we have no carve-outs in our fiscal rules to enable sufficient long-term investment. Without action, there is a serious risk that we, that we under-deliver on our climate goals and likely lose our industrial base to regions 
that impose fewer constraints on themselves. This leaves us with two options. First, we can ease state aid rules and relax fiscal rules, allowing member states to take on the burden of investment spending in full. But in the process, we will create fragmentation as even with the greater leeway that markets are allowing the euro area today, countries with more fiscal space will have much more room to spend than others. As we learned from the Deauville agreement, fragmentation makes no sense when there is a supranational objective that countries cannot achieve on their own. Just as the euro cannot be stable if large parts of the monetary union are failing, climate change cannot be solved by one country reducing its carbon emissions faster than another. So, this means that the only option that allows us to achieve our goals is the second one, to take this opportunity to redefine the European Union, its fiscal framework, and with further enlargement on the table, its decision-making process, and to make them commensurate with the challenges we face. And it so happens that the fiscal rules are currently up for discussion. The core challenge for the euro area is that we are relying on fiscal rules at the national level to deliver multiple goals. Given the crucial stabilizing rules of national budgets, we need rules that allow, country, that allow counter cyclical policy to respond to local shocks. We also need rules that facilitate the massive investment needs we require. And we need rules to ensure that the medium term credibility of the national fiscal policies in a context of very high post pandemic debt levels. But there is an inherent trade off between these goals. Ensuring fiscal credibility requires rules to be more automatic and contain less discretion. But since no rule can be tailored to all future contingencies, more automaticity will always constrain the ability of governments to react to unforeseen shocks. Likewise, Credible rules require adjustments over not too long a time horizons. But the kind of investments we need today imply long-term spending commitments, many of which will extend beyond the lifetime of the governments who are making them today. The European Commission has attempted to resolve these trade-offs by proposing to focus on an expenditure rule which is linked to a country's medium-term debt trajectory. This will certainly be an improvement on the previous deficit caps, as expansion rules would be invariant to revenue windfalls during upswings, thereby enabling the counter-cyclical stabilizing role of fiscal policy when cycle turns. The expenditure path can also be adjusted for countries undertaking investments by lengthening the period until the debt trajectory needs to start declining. But all this inevitably come at the price of automaticity and perhaps enforceability. So if we look further ahead, we need to acknowledge that truly credible fiscal rules cannot work without an equivalent rethinking of where fiscal powers should reside. As automatic rules represent a devolution of powers to the center, they can only work if they are matched by a greater degree of spending from the center. This is broadly what we see in the United States, where the devolution of powers to the federal government makes possible broadly inflex inflexible fiscal rules for the states. Balanced budget at state level are credible precisely because of fiscal transfers and federal spending on common projects, which can address unforeseen shocks and, and fund shared goals. 
The euro area will probably never replicate this structure in full, given the much greater size of national budgets relative to those of US states. But there are good reasons why importing some elements would make sense. First, if we were to carve out and federalize some of the investment spending that is needed for shared goals, it would make use of our fiscal space much more efficiently. Europe's asymmetric fiscal space, with some able to spend much more than others, is fundamentally wasteful when it comes to shared goals, like climate and defense. If some countries can spend freely on their goals but others cannot, then the impact of all spending is lower, since none are able to achieve climate or military security. Second, issuing more common debt to finance this investment would potentially enlarge the collective fiscal space we have available. The borrowing costs of the European Union are lower than the weighted average borrowing costs of its member states, and they are almost identical to those of the financing mechanisms set up during the crisis, the so-called ESM, despite this latter is sitting on so much paid in capital that it could repurchase 70% of its bonds at nominal value. This suggests that investors put significant faith in the capacity of the European Union to extract from each participating country the future stream of revenue necessary to service the underlying debt. And that in turn implies that untapped, an untapped potential for the European Union to intermediate debt and lower aggregate borrowing costs in the Union. But elevating more tasks to the federal level would require trust between member states in the ability and integrity to spend joint funds by national authorities, as much of the implementation would still take place at national level. And it would require a commensal change in our fiscal rules in the direction of less flexibility. Issuing more EU debt would, everything else equal, reduce the fiscal capacity to service national debt. And that means, as a minimum, we would need to ensure that high debt member states use the fiscal space created by the common spending to improve their fiscal outlook, a part of which could come through positive growth effects. For now, there are limits to how far we can go in this direction, not least because the borrowing cost of the Union is still above that of its strongest members meaning more common borrowing may be seen as a form of unsanctioned fiscal transfer. And so one possibility is to proceed as we've done until now with technocratic innovation, technocratic integration, making apparently technical changes and hoping that political ones will follow. This approach succeeded eventually with the Euro and with many other instances, and it has ultimately made the European Union stronger. But the costs have been high and progress has been, been very slow. The other possibility is to proceed with a genuine political process where the ultimate goal is explicit from the outset and endorsed by the voters in the form of EU treaty change. This route failed in the mid 2000s and policymakers have shed from it since. But I believe that now there is more hope of movement. As the European Union enlarges further to include the Balkans and Ukraine, it will be essential to reopen the treaties to ensure that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past by expanding our periphery without strengthening the center. <laughs>
And this should produce a natural alignment between our shared goals, collective decision making, and fiscal rules. The starting point of our, any future treaty change must be the acknowledgement of the increasing number of shared goals and the need to finance them together, which in turn necessitates a different form of representation and centralized decision making. Then a move towards more automatic rules would become more realistic. I believe that Europeans are more ready than 20 years ago to take this route. Because today, they only really have three options. Paralysis, exit, or integration. The polls are clear. The polls are clear that citizens feel an increasing sense of external threat, not least since the Russian invasion which makes paralysis increasingly unacceptable. Well, the case for exit has moved from theory to reality with Brexit. And while the benefits of leaving the European Union appear highly uncertain, the costs are all too visible. And so with paralysis and exit looking unattractive, the relative costs of further integration are now lower. At this juncture in history, we cannot stand still, or like one of the founders of the European Union said, Jean Monnet said, like his bicycle, we will fall over. We cannot stand still, or we will fall over. The strategies that had ensured our prosperity and security in the past. Reliance on the United States for security, on China for exports, and on Russia for energy. Today have become either insufficient, uncertain, or unacceptable. The challenges of climate change and migration only add to the sense of urgency to enhance Europe's capacity to act. We will not be able to build that capacity without reviewing Europe's fiscal framework. And I've tried to outline the directions this change might take. But ultimately, the war in Ukraine has redefined our union more profoundly, not only in its membership, and not only in its shared goals, but also in the awareness it has created that our future is entirely in our hands and in our unity. Thank you. Thank you.